Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Cosmic Shed. We're going to be talking about Apollo 13, the film and the NASA mission. I'm Andrew and with me today is... Ben. Oh no. Where's Laura? I don't know. <laughs> She's not in a chair. Laura! Um, I mean the shed's pretty vast and has many dimensions but I don't <laughs> think she's here. Yeah, th- this is not good. I think it's just you and me, Andrew. Oops. Uh, this could be the worst disaster the shed's ever faced. With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. We're going to be talking about not just Apollo 13, but From the Earth to the Moon, which is a dramatisation from HBO of all the Apollo missions, the documentary film In the Shadow of the Moon, Moonwalk 1 and Moonscape, and doubtless quite a lot of other things, because I find it very difficult to concentrate on one thing when we're talking about something as exciting as the Apollo missions. We're going to have some input from Laura. She's uh, she's doing that travelling around the world thing she does, but she has found time to record some stuff and send it to us. It's not just you and me talking. Oh, thank goodness. And it isn't just you and me talking. We've got an interview with Fred Hayes, who was on that mission. We've got an interview with Commander Chris Hadfield, who was on the International Space Station. And we've got an interview with Paolo Altivissimo, who's a filmmaker who's made an incredible film about the Apollo 11 moon landing. And we've got a very special surprise guest at the end, so stay tuned. But before we begin, some very exciting news. Again? Yes. Last episode, we had our very first subscriber. I remember it well. Uh, Hello, Achintia. And this week, we have our very first supporter, stroke sponsor. And Ben and I caught up with Peggy to discuss why. I'm Peggy, based in Manchester. I started Slow Brew Club about three months ago. We just specialise in single origin coffees. It's available online at the moment from slowbrewclub.com. You can get single bags, but if you're open to sort of experimenting and discovering new tastes, then you can sign up for a subscription and we'll send you a different coffee each month. You can sign up for six months or 12 months and know that at the start of each month, you'll get something fresh and tasty dropping on your doormat. I don't know too much of the detail of it, but there does seem to be a science to it. Um, the, definitely the brewing process, recommended grams that you use per litre of water, the brewing time, um, and that all sort of varies depending on what brewing equipment you use. Did you know they've got a coffee machine on the International Space Station? Yes, I've heard about that. It's exciting. Yeah, it's brilliant. The astronauts. It, it's a happy coincidence when uh, a sponsor slash supporter comes along and you actually genuinely love what they do. Uh, so it's really easy for us to to talk about. But yeah, it's amazing. Slow Brew Club is Slow the name Brew. of the coffee. It's also how we like to warm up our voices before <laughs> before doing an episode of The Cosmic Shed. Slow Brew Club, Slow Brew Club. <laughs> Hello, Brew Club. I think we need Laura here to keep us sane. If you would like a discount on a subscription, you can go to slowbrewclub.com and use the promo code COSMIC to get a discount on a subscription. You can also buy single bags if you like. And we've got a competition. We sure do, which you may have picked up on already. Um, We are going to, if we can at all, drop in quotes from the Apollo 13 film into the podcast. The winner of the competition will be the first person to email us correctly with the the, the number. Should we just ask them for the number and trust them that they've got them or should we I think we want them all. We want we want the quotes typed out on an email and sent to the cosmic shed at soundofscience.co.uk. That's the cosmic shed at soundofscience.co.uk. And yeah, three bags of amazing coffee, genuinely amazing coffee, if a little addictive, if I'm perfectly honest. Wonderful. You can also scribble down the answers on a piece of paper, take a photo. You could speak them into a recorder and email us the file. As long as we have proof that you've got them all. Yes. Anyway, we've got to do this. Failure is not an option. In this episode, there will be spoilers for the film Apollo 13 and for the real life events. But Ben, you're talking about the film and we can't talk about the film before we do Ben's poem. Right, yeah. This week, Andrew requested a rondel, 
which is different from a roundel. It's based on a French form of, of poetry. The rondel has 13 lines. Good link, good link. <laughs> uh, each with eight syllables. And it has an A, B, B, A kind of rhyme scheme. It's a bit weird. And it was a bit of a daunting, daunting prospect. And to be honest, I just didn't have a clue how to, how to, to go anywhere with this. I was, I was swimming in a sea of, of words and rhymes. And, um, I came to Andrew. I was just, I, I don't know how to do it. I don't have a map. It feels like pure guesswork at this point. And I just said, let's work the problem, people. Let's not make things worse by guessing. And that just, that just cleared me right up. And I obviously went straight to Wikipedia. Just copied the format there. It was a tough one. So I needed some help with this poem. And Laura is going to read this week's poem. She sure was a good ship, says Fred, as Aquarius plummets down. Three astronauts of great renown. Their lives hang in space by a thread. Their mission seemed mere retread. But now the only news in town, as Aquarius plummets down, she sure was a good ship, says Fred. Our finest hour, it was said, a few hours after the countdown. They just did their best not to drown, in their lifeboat torn to a shred. She sure was a good ship, says Fred. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Andrew. So, Apollo 13, the film, directed by Ron Howard, came out in 1995, uh, written by William Brawls Jr. and Al Reinert, based on the book by Jim Lovell. He wrote it with Jeffrey Kluger. Obviously, all this is based on the history of the Apollo program. So I just thought, Andrew, could you just give us a potted history of the space program that led to this point? Well, human space flight obviously started with Yuri Gagarin, 1961, uh, but uh, that was Russian, so apparently didn't matter, and it only started to matter, really. We when... will talk about the Russian space programme in a future episode. Yeah, this we... is fascinating. Absolutely brilliant. There's some brilliant films around that as well. And songs. Uh, yeah, of course. But the first American astronaut was Alan Shepard in uh, part of Project Mercury, and that whole project's covered really nicely in the, the is it Tom Wolfe book? Yeah. Um, the right stuff, which became a film, and we should cover that as well. Definitely. It's uh, basically all episodes from now on about the moon. That's <laughs> um, human space flight. So that was the Mercury program. Yeah, and that was really about testing human the human capacity to be in space. And that led on to Project Gemini, where they were testing both the human capacity and the technological capacity of space flight with a view to the Apollo programs. By the time we get to Apollo 13, we've had Apollo 1 through 12. Apollo 1, 2 and 3 were very preliminary tests. Absolutely fascinating in their own right, but probably not worthy of the film. Apollo 4 was, if you like, the the closest corollary. Is that a word that I can use? It's a lovely word. Okay, let's use it. To the Orion test launch that we've just had. So testing that capsule and, it's, and it, it, the orbiting around the Earth. So that's... Uh, that was Apollo 4. Apollo 8, they took them around the moon and those amazing images of the Earth rise. And uh, Apollo 9 and 10 were similar. And 11 famously landed on the moon. Apollo 12, most importantly, features um, in my interview with Alan Bean on one of my earlier podcasts. Great, great. Dessert Lionel Discs. All right. Where can l- listeners find that interview? Uh, On the Sound of Science website, or if you search for DLD Extra Alan Bean, you'll find it. Lovely. What a lovely man he is. The thing that I that sticks in my head most about Apollo 12 is the is Alan Bean's story of turning to face the sun, and that frying his camera and him getting back and realizing he had no images from the moon, and ultimately, of course, him becoming an artist and just painting images of the moon. Yeah. um, Which is. Wonderful in its own right. So, yeah, Apollo 13, the film, tells the story of... Jim Lovell. Played by Tom Hanks. Fred Hayes. Played by Bill Paxton. Jack Swigert. Played by Kevin Bacon. And, crucially down on Earth, Ken Mattingly. Played by Gary Sinise. Other memorable parts in the film... Flight director Gene Kranz. Played in a beautiful waistcoat by Ed Harris. And... Marilyn Lovell. Jim's wife, 
played by Kathleen Quinlan. There is so much about the Apollo missions, about the space program. Why? Why Apollo 13? Why, uh, why is this one of your favourite depictions of the Apollo mission? Well, it exists, is the main thing. From the Earth to the Moon, the, the, the HBO series, uh, with Tom Hanks, uh, what the Tom Hanks directed, is as close to what I would like to see as exists, which is a film of every single Apollo mission made into a film. But this one exists because of because of the incredible story. And it's a real scientific thing that happened. And it's right there in a mainstream film uh, being portrayed so brilliantly. Why would you not love that? It's incredible. It's absolutely close enough to the to the story to make it historically interesting. Of course, what makes Apollo 13 a movie is that once once Lovell and Swaggart and Hayes got up into space, very soon something went horribly wrong and uh, the mission had to be aborted and everyone had to come together to bring them back to Earth. Houston, we've had a problem. Which is how Jim Lovell phrased it in real life. In the film, that's changed to... Houston, we have a problem. We probably need a linguistics expert on. Do you know any? I don't know any, but it is interesting how just changing the tense like that does make it much more immediate yeah. for the film. I yeah. guess that's why they made that decision. And um, Jim Lovell's massive understatement is just... Uh, it's worth going back to listen to him on the loop. Actually, I'll post a link to that on the on the website. You can All the, all the loops, all the recordings of the, of the mission are online. You can listen to them all. Do you know what? Let's play it. Okay, stand by 13, we're looking at it. I mean, seriously, how cool can you be? So that was Jim Lovell reporting to Mission Control the the problem that, that occurred, or the first problem that occurred yeah. on the Apollo 13 mission. What was that problem? At that point, all he knew was that they'd stirred the cryo tanks. I don't think they even knew that that was what had caused it, if you know what I mean. But they, at that point, they'd, they'd heard a massive explosion and he was looking out the window and could see oxygen leaking out into space. One of the things that I really enjoyed about the film, beyond the drama of getting the astronauts back to Earth, is the whole kind of picture of the the process that got them there in the first place and all the people who played a part in that. You see the training, you see lots of detail about the simulations they use and all the people that in the team. When they're getting to, into space, of course, and there is the problem, <laughs> you really feel their training kind of kicking in so you kind of make that link back to all that setup it's that's why it's important in the film and of course in the real life accounts they almost didn't panic when something went wrong they were almost expecting it to and they were trained to deal with those problems yeah absolutely that i spoke to fred hayes um about that yeah fred hayes was actually in yorkshire in pontefract um wow yeah, there's this this amazing guy up there called Ken Willoughby, who's just he's sort of making it his mission to get all uh, astronauts over from NASA and and get, get them to do talks in Pontefract. And he's doing incredibly well. Um, wow. He's had Buzz Aldrin and Alan Bean. I mean, it, it's it's brilliant. And they're public to, events. Yeah, you can just you, there's space lectures. Uh, if you Google space lectures, you'll find if you search for it on the we'll internet. We'll put a link. Yeah, put a link. We'll put a link on the on, on the website. Actually, the next space lectures is going to be Eileen Collins, who commanded the space shuttle, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, she's coming to Pontefract in April 2015, and I think there are still tickets available. So Fred Hayes was doing one of these talks at, at space lectures. I, I had the opportunity to to sit with him beforehand in the um, in the school library because he's done in a school. And, and, and just have a bit of a chat with him. What I look at they did a very good job on was it certainly, I think the movie overall gave you a feeling of uh, certainly people with a problem to deal with, a challenge, and a team that worked to get them home. Yeah, sure. You know, so that, I think that, call it that big picture uh, thought <laughs> was there and it came through in the movie. It was not meant to be a documentary. You know, I, I've talked to Ron Howard several times and uh, I and I didn't understand the movie business, I'll have to say, but, you know, I kind of criticized he didn't uh, tell, in Burnt Involved and show other important people that were involved in this rescue and 
told me quickly, uh, you know, with two hours, you only have, you can only develop so many characters, so you got to pick and choose uh, who you're going to bring into this. And uh, he said, you know, it's got. He said, I listened to all that. Air to, they gave him all the air to ground. He listened to all of it, and he said it never sounded like he had a problem. And uh, and it was never an inflection in any voices or anything. He said it was just like routine stuff, and what it was, what what it was, troubleshooting, yeah. and uh, new procedures, and list, reading them up and down, and then going to exercise them. So he said, you know, I had to add some of these things that he recognized weren't quite right yeah. to have a little drama in the movie. And I guess it was a good, you know, it really was a good action movie. Yeah. It went a little longer than he planned. He said an action movie should never be mo much more than two hours. A little past, he want, you want a fast moving, fast clipped, and try to keep the audience on the edge of their seats. Sadly, the audio isn't quite as good as it could be. Um, so we've had to cut a bit of it out. But I asked him um, if he had any regrets, because you can imagine if you'd gone all the way to the moon and not been able to land on it, that you might have a regret. But then I also thought about it. I thought, well, no, that's still pretty amazing, isn't it? But he sa he actually said he didn't have um, any regrets about Apollo 13. His only regret really was that Apollo 19 was cancelled. So his second chance to walk on the moon was taken away from him. But he's done so many amazing things then. He flew the shuttle. He's he's had an amazing life. And he's played in Apollo 13 by Bill Paxton. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, you can go to the moon, but if there's a film in the future with Bill Paxton sitting in a shed talking about films he likes, then I'll be happy. I mean, he'd be playing you, obviously. Well, he? no, I, th I thought his role in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was based on you, Andrew. <laughs> I'm very much Agent Coulson, I think you'll find. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, so Fred Hayes, uh, or Freddo, as he's known, if you want to sound like you know him. And he's, yeah, he just feels incredibly fortunate, as he says, to accidentally have been in the career path at the right time. That must have been brilliant to chat to him. It's an absolute honour. It really is. Amazing people who have done amazing things. And the humility and humanity is brilliant. Another thing about the Apollo missions and those those guys who went to the moon they were fighter pilots yes they were clever guys but they were normal human beings they weren't superhuman but i think it, it, the story is so inspirational because what we're talking about is hundreds if not thousands of human beings ordinary human beings combining their talents and their efforts to make something incredible happen and they did it. And I think that's why it's such a compelling story. Both times when I've, when I've met both Alan Bean and Fred Hayes, it's, it, it's a common narrative and what they're saying is how they were just one, they were just the lucky ones on the spacecraft. And they were no more important in the team than anybody else. They're just one of the people, so if there's somebody missing from the film, then it feels very odd to them who are part of it, so yeah. that, that, that they're not in it. Absolutely, but you do see a heck of a lot of the Mission Control, you see Ed Harris, you see the Capcom guys who are, who are brilliant, you see the backroom boys trying to fix the, the scrubbing units, you do get a real sense of that picture, and it kind of should be used for management training, I think, business training, it feels like such a great way that everyone's working, and there's a quote from Ken Mattingly, which is a lovely piece, uh, very in-depth oral history uh, which can be found uh, at the NASA Johnson Space Center Oral History Project, which is all online. Um, we'll link to it. The text is really small, so use something clearly. I use Evernote clearly to make it look good. <laughs> but it's it's the text is brilliant. And he says, The beauty of the program was that everybody knew Apollo was so hard, that there was no room for any distraction, no room for politics. There's no personalities getting in. I don't care who's got the right answer, just get it right and it's okay. It didn't matter if it's the new kid on the block or the guy who was retired. Anyone who's got an answer to our problems is sought after and appreciated. And you don't get to work in that climate very often. But yeah, I really think that comes across in the film. I kind of watched it quite recently. I hadn't seen it probably since the 90s. And I guess I'd sort of taken it for granted a bit as this nice tea time Ron Howard film. 
But in a way, it feels almost like it could be an Aaron Sorkin film about why people work, people coming together. Not that Aaron Sorkin is always brilliant, but when he kind of locks into that theme in The West Wing and Sports Night, it's brilliant. And you have the same kind of thing in Apollo 13. You have people who've worked ridiculously hard, crammed all these this jargon into their brains, have rehearsed these clicking switches over and over again, have, you know, worked in the back room, everyone coming together to, to make the mission a success in the first place, and then when, when the problem happens to get those guys home, it feels like, well, that's what we all want, we're to be part of that team, whatever we're doing, to be part of a team who's all working towards that goal. Absolutely, and I specifically want to be part of the Apollo 13 team, so if you could... Uh get a time machine that'd be amazing who well who would you want to be within that team do you know i want i want to be a kind of not very important cog because i'd probably mess it up but i'd just like to be in the room when it's happening or or on the spacecraft actually that would be pretty cool but yeah i probably wouldn't be because of my asthma i would yeah. I'd, I'd probably wouldn't have survived the flight as a result so. yeah I, I mean i really like the guy who's kind of trying to deal with the electricity have they got enough power in the batteries and yeah. he's going back and forth to ken and yeah. the the boffins to get that worked out yeah actually one thing i wanted to ask you andrew mm. we kind of it's a bit of a trope now in science fiction is the slingshotting oh yeah you always kind of see it yeah we'll just slingshot around the sun and we'll get there in half the time yeah and in this film that's what they do right they slingshot around the moon yeah. to get back into earth's orbit absolutely and in reality that's what they did yeah, yeah. how does how does that work <laughs> Well, gravity, right? Yeah, yeah. You use the you use the gravity of whatever it is you're slingshotting around to pull the spacecraft and speed it up, and then slingshot. Effectively, is the word slingshot it back out. So you can space. use far less fuel. Yeah, yeah, completely. It's it, it's 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 sort of to a non physicist, it feels counterintuitive, doesn't it? But it's it, it's amazing. It's interesting what Fred says as well about the um, about. Ron Howard listening back to the to the tapes, and he said it didn't sound like he had a problem. Yeah. So he had to change it uh, and add some drama to it for for the film purposes. But yeah. because I, I mean that's absolutely fair enough. But it, it isn't that brilliant that their training was such that when I mean they had trained for all sorts of eventualities, but I don't think they trained for something as bad as this. Of course, it was it was a quadruple. Yeah, threat, right? Absolutely. Like, at least four things went wrong. Yeah, but still, uh, their training was so good that they were able to deal with it in in, in the way that they did. But but it, it also uh, worth noting that Marilyn Lovell, when she was listening back on one of those NASA boxes that they have, how much do I want one of those? She said that she could tell from Jim's voice that something was wrong. Um, but it probably took a wife to do that. Um, you know, Ron Howard didn't pick it up. And it's not as if they inject ridiculous amounts of drama. There are additions, there's kind of extra tension among the crew, yeah. there's some extra parts that they they do dramatise of the mission itself. But I think what was really refreshing, watching Apollo 13 again, uh, after Interstellar and The Imitation Game, was how much it trusts the audience just to kind of go with the story. There's lots of quite dense language it feels like they're trusting you just to go with the story and to trust that you can you can lock onto something with all these characters it doesn't it doesn't kind of pick out even though it's tom hanks in the role of jim lovell it doesn't sort of lionize him as this incredible hero who saves the day they all have a part to play do you know what i'm missing laura can we get her involved I've been talking to some people about how we can get her back on the podcast even though she's not here and they yeah. want to put a transmitter up on the lawn yeah, is that possible? Is there space in the garden for that? I, I thought it was a bit over the top, to be honest. So I asked Laura to record her thoughts, and here they are. Hi, Andrew and Ben. So as per usual, I loved everything about the film. One of my favourite scenes from the entire movie was the broadcast from space from Apollo 13 and its crew uh, just prior to disaster striking. It provided such comic relief, but at the same time, it really brings to the front of the audience's mind that why is this mission seen as routine? Why is a mission to outer space um, and exploring the unknown? Why is this now seen as routine by the American public and the world? I loved that the film built up the drama so realistically and you watched as the crew progressed through each problem and each complication step by step and the tension builds as the movie progresses and then there's a sheer jubilation and relief when 
they find the heat shield is not broken and they return safely to Earth. Apollo 13, it involved adventure, exploration, science, space and Tom Hanks. I mean, what is there not to love? Tom played Jim beautifully in my opinion. It was such a believable and natural performance. And perhaps it was so refreshingly on point as Jim Lovell actually starred in the movie as Iwo Jima's captain, the recovery ship that picked up Apollo 13's crew upon returning to Earth. With Jim being involved in the film, he could perhaps communicate the exhilaration and the thrill of venturing into the unknown, and then the emotion and drama of this unforeseen disaster that the Apollo 13 and its crew found themselves in. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. I think we probably undervalued Tom Hanks a little, although after Captain Phillips, we certainly shouldn't. I have seen it. Amazing performance. Is it? Yeah. Oh, my God. The end, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but the, the final scene of Captain Phillips is astonishing. Yeah. Um, and or he's doing amazing work with the whole or he has done certainly amazing work with promoting this these Apollo missions and, yeah. and keeping that story going so he's a fan he's a fan he's, get him on he's the a podcast. communicator that'd be brilliant <laughs> yeah but no he does a fine job in the film of embodying Jim Lovell's dependable leadership and, and quiet charisma and, and that all that understated stuff you, you were just talking about I think yeah, he does. does a really good job. He does a great job. It's not as good as his performance in Dragnet, for example, but, you know, it's not bad. I love Gary Sinise as Ken Mattingly, yeah. the guy who's left on Earth, becomes this, this brilliant part of the team, like running all the simulations and working in mission control with them. That could have been jettisoned from the whole story. It's not, you know, you wouldn't necessarily need that to tell the story, but he does such a great job with it. The character is yeah. just fascinating. We've also got Bill Paxton as... As your friend, Fredo, yeah, yeah. struggling uh, very stoically with sickness in space. The illness is overplayed. It wasn't. He wasn't quite that ill, etc., etc. But it doesn't matter. We've got Kevin Bacon, of course, um, as the the studly young space pilot who kind of finds himself on this mission almost by accident. And yeah, maybe some of that tension is a little cheesy between the between Hayes and Swigert. That's the one slight issue I have is is that um, friction between Swigert and, and and Fred Hayes I mean it didn't happen like that you know the, the training that they were doing they wouldn't they wouldn't put two people up there who would get at each other in, in that way but it works it's fine I don't really have yeah, a problem it doesn't need there was actually an IMAX re-release of the film in 2001 oh, right. that cut out 20 minutes of footage so Perhaps those scenes were, were left on the floor. I didn't see that version. Yeah, well, that, that's. But the, that, yeah, you could lose those scenes very easily. One one of the other things which is different in, in the film's reality, I just think it's worth noting that in reality, they got the when they were coming back and they needed to do the burns to get to the right trajectory to get back into Earth's atmosphere. They came back round towards Earth and they got the Earth in the window. That's absolutely. How and they, they both, the two of them, had to be. Yeah, one does the vertical, one does the horizontal. Yeah, absolutely, and they did that, and they, in the film, this doesn't happen, but in real life, they never lost it. It was they did two burns, dead simple, straight as an arrow, back to earth. I mean, yeah, but not dead simple, only dead simple because they were so skilled. Absolutely, but um, yeah, but again, the film doesn't overplay that at all. It's it's not like it doesn't show asteroids crashing into them. Or, <laughs> It basically sticks sticks to the story, but gives it a bit of extra oomph. And also, also a particular note, as we said before, is Ed Harris as Gene Krantz back in Mission Control. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And such a memorable performance, he was brought back to be the voice of, of Houston in Gravity. I think Kathleen Quinlan plays Marilyn Lovell brilliantly, and Marilyn Lovell agrees. One of the scenes that you might think was invented, where she drops the ring down the shower... Um, while he's up there in space, actually did happen. There are so many stories within it, so many roles in it that are, are interesting to think about. I love it because it's interesting, actually, what you said, that you, that you took it for granted, really. As yeah, a sort of... yeah, I think so. Well, it's the part of partly when it came out. You yeah. know, I, was a, I was a pretentious teenager. Yeah. I was into you know Hong Kong. Hong Kong films and oh, wow. I, I maybe just, just Not Hong didn't... Kong Fui. Hong Kong Fui was great. Uh, that was earlier <laughs> in my life. Yeah. So, but actually, part part of what's really nice about the film is its its time. It was that kind of cusp 
of digital technology really coming into film, but still a lot of model work and physical physical stuff. So they were using um, using the digital technology to kind of enhance the models, enhance the real sets, mm. rather than just CGI all the time. Mm. Which again was what was really nice about Interstellar: the model work, the real sets they built. But it, yeah, and that's I think in Apollo thirteen it. It feels dated in some ways, but also it feels really solid. That's another quirk of history. It was a point in time when computers were being used more and more to enhance visuals, but we still had that that lovely physicality. It's a great film, and I really recommend, if you haven't seen it recently, um, go and find it. If you want to find out more about the, the astronauts, some of the astronauts from the Apollo program and some of the stories, uh, we can highly recommend In the Shadow of the Moon. Yeah. A documentary. Um, Ron Howard as well. Which Ron Howard produced. Yeah. yeah. And it uses a lot of brilliant stock footage from the, from the program. Some great music, actually. I really enjoyed the music. And it's all told in the astronauts' words. There's no narration. It's just their words. It has Gene Krantz, um, who features in Apollo 13 and other, other people from the program. So we hear from most of the, most of the astronauts. Jim Lovell is in there. Fred Hayes is there. Michael Collins. Dr. Rendezvous. <laughs> Dr. Rendezvous? Dr. Rendezvous. Buzz Aldrin uh, has a PhD in rendezvous in space. <laughs> I, know. I know. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. that's not in the Captain Kirk. Sort of no, it's not in the Captain Kirk kind of way. Meeting the beautiful yeah. alien on the planet. Yeah, by all accounts, um, Buzz would, when the other guys were at the parties in, in the um, Captain Kirk kind of way, Buzz was chatting away to anyone who would listen about the physics and maths of rendezvous in space. Incredible. You were saying before that you know, astronauts are, are regular human beings. Seeing Buzz Aldrin in that film, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I don't know, I think he might be Kryptonian. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing, isn't he? He is absolutely brilliant. There's something otherworldly about that guy. Yeah, he's the, he's the one astronaut that I'm slightly scared about ever meeting. I can't imagine that I could hold my own in a conversation with him, is the thing. You know? Just ask him about rendezvous and you'll be ah, Yeah, I'd love to. I wonder what an amazing podcast would that be? Anyway, they're all there. They're all there. Apart from... I don't want to give too much away, but there's a book, Moon Dust, by Andrew Smith, which... Equally, I highly recommend. So Andrew Smith set about trying to meet all the remaining Apollo astronauts. And, um, yeah, there's an elusive one. Whether he meets him or not, you'll have to read the book. Uh, but absolutely fascinating book, which really goes into what what happens to the psyche of a man who's been to the moon. What happens when he comes back and lives, and lives the rest of his life as a man who's walked on the moon. Yeah. There were 24 men walked on the moon and that's one of the things that does come across watching that documentary it's all white men and there's nothing we can do about that there's nothing anyone can do about that other than maybe kind of wish that people in the space program kennedy even any someone was a bit more a bit more far-sighted and kind of really taken the spirit of the 60s and all the change that was going on just been a bit more far-sighted about who was on the moon. It would be lovely to kind of think about that, I guess, an alternative history where there were people of colour in that 24, where there were women, where there were there was more of a diversity of people. We're kind of stuck with that, and the film Apollo 13 is stuck with that, and doesn't really, it, it's not in the business of kind of questioning that, but it's just something that lingers. Hopefully, the new space programme, as we take people up into space, obviously there have been, there have been several astronauts of colour, there have been Several women astronauts from Sally Ride onwards. Yeah, well, obviously there were the two Russians before that. Valentina Tereshkova and Svetlana Savitskaya. But then the Americans do have a history of being a little behind the Russians in the space race. There's a film called Moonwalk One, which is... It's a time capsule, really. So NASA commissioned Theo Kamecki to make uh, a film about the Apollo 11 moon landing. And he went away and did it, but he's a, he was a very sort of, it's not a documentary. It's very much a time capsule. And it was made in the 70s. Made, yeah. Made in 69. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. But it, it took a, a while to, to come out. And why I'm talking about it now is because it shows a lot of footage of the time and what was happening around the world at the time. And it's, yeah, it's just fascinating to, to, to see that because it really places 
the Apollo program in history. Apollo 13 is coming up for its 20th anniversary next year, as we record. Why, why else did we choose to focus on Apollo 13? Because this month saw the launch of the Orion space capsule, which is the next generation of manned spaceflight. It marks the start, if you like, of the next stage of manned spaceflight for NASA. And the Orion capsule, if you, if you think of those Apollo capsules that splashed back down in the ocean after, after they'd been up to, to the moon. The, the stripy parachutes. With the stripy parachutes, absolutely. Um, if you think of those, then the Orion is the next generation of those. And where those were quite small in comparison and could fit three people, the Orion capsule can take six people to the International Space Station or four people to the moon. They did a, a launch of it in the early part of December and it went flawlessly, absolutely flawlessly. Uh, the results of the, the various tests that they were doing on board are not fully through yet, but I, I think the long-term sort of taking people back to the moon and uh, onto asteroids and landing on asteroids and things like that, which is obviously something we've not done. We've landed robots on, on a comet very recently, obviously, but actually landing people on an asteroid, that'd be amazing if we can do something like that. One of the best moments in the Orion test flight was when they showed a picture from a video camera of the Earth through the window of the spacecraft from 3,000 miles up. Uh, that's ten times as high or as far away from Earth as the International Space Station. And it was 42 years ago on Apollo 17 was the last time that a spacecraft had been out that far that is designed for, 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 for human flight. Why are they going back to the moon? I mean, I could answer that. But I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Chris Hadfield recently, former commander of the International Space Station at, at Bristol. Bristol Science Centre. He was doing a, a sold-out talk there, as you can imagine. <laughs> Everything he does, I'm sure, is sold out. And I asked him what the astronaut's perspective can bring to life on Earth. You'll hear, uh, when when we play this, that he was signing books as we were talking, so you'll hear the constant slap of books. Um, so the title of my first book is An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. So I, I really think that's an important question to ask. It's it's one I, uh, I, I addressed in uh, a couple decades of talks that I gave to schools and businesses, and then one that I tried to coalesce into, um, into the astronaut's guide. And I think uh, a large part of it is in just the, uh, the personal lessons learned. How do you prepare to do something that is um, hazardous? How do you not let fear dictate the limitations of your life? Or how do you know where to draw the light, right line between uh, danger and, and fear, between risk and reward? Um, how do you maintain optimism in something where the pre preparation process for it might be decades long and there's no guarantee that you will ever actually get to do what it is you're preparing for. How do you continue to stay optimistic and productive when you've got that on your horizon? How do you deal with an enormous success in life and somehow let that roll into the rest of your life without either poisoning or dominating or, um, or diminishing the rest of your experience? And um, and I think that's part of it. That's part of the, the personal level uh, experience of being an astronaut that, that is worthwhile to other people. On the other side, of course, is the uh, science and research that we're doing on the space station right now. The, uh, the challenge of doing something that is right on the edge of the human experience inspires people to come up with inventions that otherwise wouldn't exist. Uh, and there are, there are countless numbers through the history of the space program. Even in my time there, the, uh, the uh, blood analysis machine called Microflow that we invented for Space Station that is now in commercial production around the world, a small portable blood flow uh, or blood uh, analyzer that otherwise never would have existed. Um, and then the third side of it is straight inspiration in that if you are not challenging the young people within your particular society to do things that were either impossible or just barely possible when you were their age, then they will seek that challenge somewhere else and leave your society or worse, 
they will never challenge themselves to the level of potential of which they were capable. And those are both tragic uh, within a civilization. And it's not the only thing going on, but I think um, the human spaceflight program plays a significant role in all three of those areas. It's such an honour to talk to him. and I talked to him about a few things there. We'll bring it to you in a later episode. I think it's all too easy to say, why on earth would we send people out into space when we've got these robots? But I think Chris Hadfield makes three very good points there. As as brilliant as the Curiosity Mars rover is and the amazing science that it's doing, and the the, the, the amount that it's caught the, the public's imagination, the same way with Rosetta and the amazing science that it's doing, nothing can galvanise the Earth or the people of the Earth like putting people out in space the way they did for the Apollo programmes. Obviously there are massive risks of pulling people up into space. We've seen that with the shuttle disasters, the cosmonauts who lost their lives in the in those days, and the, and the Apollo program as well. There were pe- you know people losing their lives. It's funny to think, isn't it, that it, it, you can imagine Apollo, the Apollo program happening now, and one of the first tests they do on the on the out there on the test bed is three of the astronauts die in a fire. I can't imagine that the program would have continued in today's world there was just no question in in their minds that of course the the astronauts who died wanted the program would have wanted the program to go on they wanted the program to go on the shuttle disasters are are, are obviously a key part of that that um program coming to an end yeah the shuttle was so iconic in our childhood yeah that was that was our image of yeah i don't know of everything really of of space of of america of like of the kind of pinnacle of technology, yeah. and then the Challenger and other other Columbia, disasters happen. Yeah. With all that loss of life, really, is what we're talking about. There's definitely an argument for more robots and less men, and less not women. from the robots, though. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not arguing that. Poor old Tars. But I think that it's hard to say this because it's not my life that I'm putting at risk. But those those astronauts are going into it knowing the risks, and they 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 want to be part of that, and they know. As Chris Hadfield said, the, the the benefits of it far outweigh that that sort of thing. If you stop and think about it, it's a miracle that that anyone has made it up there in the first place. That anyone ever made it to the moon, and when you, oh, when, especially when you go and actually see some of the technology in the yeah. science museum, and you, yeah. you see how thin and fragile the lunar lander is, to even imagine that we could do it, and then all the all the steps that need to go into it. Is is absolutely mind blowing, and that's really brought home when you when you watch a, a film such as Apollo thirteen. It's just incredible, and it's why it fascinates me. It's a never ending source of fascination for me. Um, all the books, all the films, literally everything about it, I will consume. Of course, there are some people who don't, who believe that none of this is true, and we didn't actually go to the moon at all, which is a real shame. But you can see their argument. There's these Tom two... Hanks is telling us we went. <laughs> Surely, what else do they need? Yeah, well, quite. He's done everything. He's been in a film, he's directed a film, he's done voiceovers. Yeah. He's written a short story about it in The New Yorker. I mean... Well, yeah, it's not all about Tom Hanks, you know. The vast majority of what they say is easily dismissed with a very simple understanding of photography, film, history, the way human beings work, the way life is, and evidence. But there is one question that they ask, which I just think is worth addressing very briefly, and it's about the Van Allen belts. And the Van Allen belts are two donut shaped rings, effectively, of radiation that surround the planet Earth. And the question is, with that amount of radiation, how did they get through that to the moon? And it seems like a valid question. I mean, high radiation, yeah, absolutely. Why, <laughs> that's dangerous. Why, why would you put astronauts through that? And well, the answer is quite simple. You'd need to spend four months inside one of the Van Allen belts in order to receive the lethal dose of radiation. The Apollo astronauts spent one hour in it. The Van Allen belts were discovered by Dr. James Van Allen. Uh, it's speaking about conspiracy theorists, he says, It's an ingenious and entertaining assemblage of nonsense, and the claim that radiation exposure during the Apollo missions would have been fatal to the astronauts is just one example of such nonsense. And you'd think that would be the question answered. And it is, but not for some of them. And the Orion test went through the Van Allen belts, 
to measure the radiation and see the effect on the computers. And again, the question comes from the conspiracy theorists. Well, why wouldn't you already know that? Because if you'd already been through with the Apollo missions, then you'd already know. Well, they do know. But what they don't know is the effect that it has on today's computers. Obviously, the computers in the Apollo missions were completely different to the ones now. And passing through the Van Allen belt isn't going to cause a problem. Worth noting, though, that the International Space Station is just below one of the Van Allen belts. I say just below, in terms of space it is. And a solar storm can actually force the Van Allen belts down so that the International Space Station is actually inside one of the belts. Again, it wouldn't happen for, for four months, but... You don't need to have the lethal dose. If the International Space Station is in there for a significant amount of time, obviously that can cause harmful damage to the to the astronauts and the systems on board. But anyway, enough about them. We went to the moon. It's obvious. And if you don't believe it, you're missing out. I bumped into a man. He was at the Fred Hayes talk up in Pontefract. He was involved in a brilliant project called Moonscape, and I asked him all about it. My name's Paolo Attivissimo, born in Yorkshire, despite the Italian-sounding name. I live in Switzerland, and uh, I'm a science writer. I work for Swiss National Radio and Television, uh, doing science popularisation. And one of my hobbies is uh, explaining that we actually did go to the moon six times, and uh, we brought back lots of science and lots of knowledge about ourselves, not just the universe. It's um, a project we started for four years ago. Uh, freely available, downloadable from the internet at moonscape.info. It's a complete, real-time restoration, resynchronization of the entire Apollo 11 moon landing and EVA. So the whole first moonwalk of mankind has been restored as much as possible directly from the original sources. And then I assembled all this with the dialogues, with subtitles, with the onboard audio which was recorded during the descent. So you can actually hear Buzz and Neil talking to each other you know, uh, offline, off the record, and saying ah, how they were really feeling. And uh, I, I just offer this for free. It's available on the internet at moonscape.info. So yes, it's amazingly well restored footage. It really is. Yeah, it looks gorgeous. That footage that they got there of that Apollo 11 moon landing was caught actually picked up by the Parkes Telescope in Australia, covered heartwarmingly in the film The Dish. But it's interesting to note that the Parkes Telescope in Australia is now facing such funding cuts that it might have to close, and lots of people are losing their jobs there. This is the telescope that brought us those pictures from the moon. And yes... And Sam Neill was in it! <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's the film, Ben! Oh, um, sorry. sorry. And, uh, Did Tom Hanks visit? No. He should? Yeah. Maybe they'd be all right. <laughs> you might say, well, yeah, but that was then. What use is it doing now? Well, only last week it discovered a radio burst coming from the Aquarius constellation, six billion light years. And because they can now, when they get the signals, they can now see them in real time. They were then able to pass that message on to the other telescopes who could then look at the same region of sky immediately and discover that those, that radio burst had gone, which means that that radio burst did not come from a stellar explosion. It came from something else. Wow. We don't know what it is, but we do know that we send short radio bursts up into space. Wow. All I'm saying, don't cut funding for telescopes. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, incredible. Another thing that's inextricably linked in my mind anyway to the Apollo missions is that music that they played and it's always interesting to see what music they played up there. Neil Armstrong took the um, New World Symphony to listen to. Good choice. They take a radio in the film don't they? Yeah yeah they did. They yeah. float it around. Yeah they did that. Um, well, it's probably a tape player isn't it? Yes yeah, a tape player. They wouldn't really get radio yeah, signals up there. No. Probably no. can get radio for yeah. by the moon. So if with the Orion programme they do end up sending people to the moon again there's a there's a real possibility that they could ask you what would it be it'd be 18 now Apollo Orion 18 well if i go up on 19 yeah i'm going to take my entire collection of johnny cash with me anyway um Great. i literally could speak about apollo for the rest of my life as you well know we probably will come to back, back to it in future episodes but uh, it's getting cold in here it's getting windy outside it's getting windy you can probably pick that up um we've really missed laura sorry that uh, you weren't here 
for this, Laura, but thanks for your input anyway. But Laura will be back with us next time, next year, 2015. Lots of great stuff coming up on the Cosmic Shed next year. We're not quite sure when yet, but we will be looking at The Martian by Andy Weir. We'll probably be covering The Theory of Everything. We've got to bring you the rest of that interview with Commander Hadfield and look at gravity talk about gravity yeah there's loads of stuff coming up ex machina is coming up the new alex garland artificial intelligence film so we'll link back to to alan turing and that one i'm sure just mentioning alan turing uh, i just finished reading a brilliant graphic novel called logi comics oh yeah um which it's not focused, focused around bertram russell and the kind of quest to perfect logic and mathematics and how that kind of links in with morals and does mention Alan Turing very briefly and kind of all that all that history almost led up to to Turing's work with with computers and artificial intelligence so well worth checking out logic comics it's it's dense it's funny it's um beautifully illustrated and really cleverly kind of plays off the real story with invention and with kind of commentary on the story it's great Thanks for listening. Thanks for all your feedback and sharing the episodes with other people. It's going well. We're getting yeah. a lot of listens. It's really great. Brilliant. Yeah, a few people reviewing us on iTunes as well, which is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Do do do. If you enjoy it, do it. I suppose if you don't enjoy it, you can do it too. But um, it'd be great to hear from you. Do send us. They enter the competition. Try and spot all the quotes we did from the film. Um, they're pretty obvious. <laughs> they, we did make them pretty obvious. Um, but yeah, go, go back, listen again if you if you want to win those three packs of coffee. Oh, it's such good coffee. It's well worth it. <laughs> and thanks to the Slow Brew Club for supporting us as a very, very special treat. Ben? Yeah, we had the fantastic actor and writer Ben Folks in the shed with us this week. Mr. You Bloom. may know him as Mr. Bloom from the CBB series. And he very kindly agreed to read The Cosmic Shed, a bedtime story. Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown In the great green room there was a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of the cow jumping over the moon and there were three little bears sitting on chairs and two little kittens and a pair of mittens and a little toy house and a young mouse and a comb and a brush and a bowl full of mush and a quiet old lady who was whispering hush good night room good night moon good night cow jumping over the moon good night light and the red balloon good night bears good night chairs good night kittens and good night mittens good night clocks and good night socks Good night, little house, and good night, mouse. Good night, comb, and good night, brush. Good night, nobody, good night, mush. And good night to the old lady whispering hush. Good night, stars. Good night, air. Good night, noises everywhere. Good night, cosmic shed. The Cosmic Shed. Science fact. Science fiction. And everything in between. If in my life, I'm in my, the story of my life, Bill Paxman sitting in a shed talking about films he likes. Bill Paxman? That's what Jeremy's I brother? Yeah. What's he called? Jeremy Paxman. What's he called? Bill Paxton. So, the, uh, the three astronauts who went up in Apollo 13. Jim Lovell. Played by Tom Hanks. Fred Hayes. Played by Bill Paxton. And in the bacon role... That doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's... well, I don't think it works.